everybody, welcome to the Trader Merlin Show. It is your Wednesday edition. Today we have a, a fun show, a topic that might be very different. Uh, as we've talked so much on this program about bonds, we've had Bill Addis on the program a bunch talking about bonds and bond markets. You know, there is a this mythical figure. It's like a unicorn that exists in the financial world. And you don't hear about it very often, but every now and again, it rears its head and all of a sudden people go, bond vigilantes, what are bond vigilantes? They're, they're back, the bond vigilantes are back. So I thought it'd be a good opportunity for us to take a step back and look at some of the more you know, fundamental components of the market and really what drives the way that these markets are acting and bond vigilantes and what is the role. So as you can see, I've got a, a great graphic here. It says, what is a bond vigilante? Our guest today can help us break all this down is none other than Mr. John, the ambassador of opportunity, as I like to call him, O'Donnell. How are you doing, John? I'm doing great, Merlin. How are you? Good, man. Uh, Happy to have you with us again. It's been a while. Everything going good in your world? Everything is fine. There's nothing wrong with me that uh, a $1 million Bitcoin wouldn't fix. (laughs) A $1 million Bitcoin. I'm sure that would fix a lot of people's problems here. I'm sure it would. I know it would help you out a little bit. Yeah. Um, I realize that some people may not be able to chat right now. Let me see if I can fix this one on the fly for us. But um, walk us through a little bit of um, what your thoughts are in bond vigilantes and kind of what that might mean for our markets. Uh, I guess let's talk about bond vigilantes and what their role is in the market. Well, their role is really uh, price discovery. And uh, as you labeled me, the ambassador of opportunity, um, overbought markets need to get sold and um, overbought, uh, oversold markets need to get bought. But the bond vigilantes show up when market conditions prevail in the bond market, uh, where we've had a, a, especially a drastic speedy move in change of price. Of, of either the price of the bond or the yield. I mean, you, you can take it either way. And um, it's time to become a net seller. And we forget that there are bonds in all strata of, of the credit uh, credit uh, capital cycle. You know, we've got corporate bonds. We get, There's a time to be a net seller of corporate bonds. Would you like to, I mean, there's, there's all the instruments in the crypto market that, that need to get sold when it's appropriate. And, uh, you know, there's credit instruments in the municipal market and, in, in the, and of course, the federal market or the, the state market. So bond vigilantes show up and ultimately will greatly impact and determine uh, why price discovery is so important to capitalism. We're pricing credit. Right. So if, if bond, let's say, and, and typically I think bond vigilantes were referencing the, the big bond traders. And I, th- and I think that might have morphed over the years. It just represents, you know, a general feeling of um, that, that the bonds need to be sold for whatever reason. So if we look at that, and, and I, I try to always put things into perspective of what's going on with our current market and how might this uh, phenomenon of bond vigilantes who are larger entities selling bonds in the open market, Correct me if I'm wrong, but we have a situation right now where yields are surging higher. You have the tra- uh, the Federal Reserve, by the way, for those who may not know. Let's let's see. Um, for some reason, I'm not seeing a live chat on my one feed, but I can see it on the YouTube feed, so it's going to be a little bit delayed here. But go ahead and type in the chat, guys. You know that the Federal Reserve has, has bumped their balance sheet from uh, in 2020, I want to say it was – uh, oh, I can't remember the numbers, but it's been trillions of dollars of money pumped in uh, of purchases of securities by the Fed to prop up this market. In the last year, how much has the Fed sold of their balance sheet? Just go ahead and type that in the chat. In the last year, how much has the Fed sold off their balance sheet? Now, keep in mind it was at $8.9 trillion, uh, so we, we were just kissing that $9 trillion mark, but how much of that have they sold in the last year? Now, the reason I bring that up, John, is because if we go back to basic econom- economics, if I have somebody unloading bonds and they're selling bonds, which is what bond vigilantes are doing, that means they're putting more supply of bonds in the marketplace. 
If more bonds are being sold, then that to me would imply that the yields would need to go up because you're now trying to entice people to buy this flood of inventory coming on the market. Would that be a safe statement? Yeah, you, you've got, uh, you know, supply overwhelming demand. Right. And, and so bond vigilantes um, can be good, but they also can cause, you know, serious impacts to the markets, right? They get serious uh, flooding of supply and therefore these yields could continue significantly higher. Absolutely. Plus, they're going to be impacted. Let's not, let's not forget another category of participant, which is the speculator. Right. And the speculator can, can at the margin, ultimately determine uh, how extreme you know, price change can become. But uh, the speculators are going to have a major role to play in this. And matter of fact, it's not just, though, you know, remember the biggest holders of bonds probably in the world, uh, and they're in the global bond markets are the insurance companies, mm -hmm. you know, trying to match yield. They, not, may, they may not be net sellers, but they may have done some hedging. Right. Right. So, um, so you're right. The Fed has probably the biggest impact, I would guess, in the whole world have been the central banks. Right. And their behavior in, in, selling, in selling their inventories. You know, I've received, I've received, Pushback, and of course, I am. I'm happy with friendly, open discussion. Uh, I don't ever expect that people agree with me 100, percent and nor should they. I think I'm going to be wrong on a lot of topics, and I've seen many of you guys um, push back a little bit and say, "Well, hold on, this is wrong." Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm welcome to to those types of uh, friendly discussions. However, my uh, talk track has been yields are going higher, and I'm pretty certain of it. And there's two factors here. I think that everyone is needs to understand is number one is. We are the government is putting us into more debt every single day. I don't think anybody here can can ignore that. So if the government is taking on more and more debt, I mean, look, the, the it, we're supporting Israel, we're supporting um, the Ukraine, not to mention other countries, countless other countries around the world that we're supporting from a monetary perspective. That puts us further into debt. And in order to pay the interest on that debt, the Treasury Department sells bonds. So you have the Treasury Department selling more bonds than ever. That said, some of you, uh, let's see, the numbers here. Sava said $1 trillion. Chico, Chio said $12 trillion. Tradia says $800 billion. Manatee says $20 trillion. It is about $1 trillion. If you look back here to uh, May of 2022, right? So you go May of 2022, we were at about $8.935 trillion. And as of the most recent date, which goes to October, so slightly over a year, we're down to 7.9. So the Fed has sold $1 trillion worth of assets off its balance sheet. So I'm looking at this as a double whammy, John. I've got the Treasury Department doing 10-year bond auctions and selling as much as they can to pay this debt. But that goes hand in hand with the Federal Reserve unloading their balance sheet. Uh, you know, I, I can't think of a reason why bonds yields would go down at this point. Can you think of something? Am I missing something? No, may, may, maybe supply and demand now is in equilibrium. But, you know, for every seller, there needs to be a buyer. Uh, so when somebody's out there selling in an aggressive fashion, there's somebody on the other trend. You know, we may not know who the uh, in entity is on the other side of the decision, but somebody's buying those bonds. Right, they're right. Just buying, they're just buying them at the wrong, perhaps at the wrong price. Mm-hmm. And, and I like you said, at, at perhaps the wrong price. And you know, I think, you know, when you look at a, at a 10 year now, and I'll bring up the chart for everybody so you can see what the 10 year is doing. Here it is as we speak. Uh, you had a, a giant spike down today on that 10 year. Uh, you're at 4.73%. And when you look around the world at uh, interest rates, you know, some of the best yielding for 10 year around the world, it's going to be the US. And of course, I think the the world looks at the US as the benchmark for credit quality, even though we we're downgraded by uh, an agency here recently, you know, you're getting 4.73%. So you're right, John, demand may be increasing for these 10 years because hell, if I can lock in right now and get 4.73% for the next decade, that may be just what I need for my personal needs. Um, I, I well, still think it's going higher though. Let's think about who might be creating that demand. It might be pension plans, right? Trying to lock in some yields and, and there certainly might be insurance companies. Uh, yeah. Annuities for sure. Right. Annuities, you know, the annuity industry globally. And remember, the bonds that we're talking about right now are bonds denominated in U.S. dollars. And so the currency component of this, you know, is going to have a big impact because 
wouldn't you rather, if you want to be in the market to own a, a 30-year bond, and a lot of bonds are bought not just for the yield, but remember capital gain. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, bonds fluctuate in price as does the yield. So there's, you know, buying bonds cheap um, after a spike in interest rates that we've gone through in this cycle. Uh, you're right. Might be a good time to buy bonds. And if interest rates continue to climb, you know, the Fed, I thought, said today they're not necessarily finished raising rates. Or they didn't wag their tail too much about that they're, you know, one and done. I, we haven't heard that conversation right. in a while. And um, because inflation is they're not at their target, which is two percent, which I still think is a ridiculous target. I don't even think there should be a target, uh, quite frankly. Right. Uh, I think the market should determine rates and not some arbitrary number like 2% and then settle for 25 and a half. And uh, because inflation is theft, it's, it's the most insidious tax put on capital, in my opinion. Yeah. Let me uh, share with everybody out here. I have, uh, I went to Bloomberg and pulled this one up here just to show you the yields. You know, if you look at, let's say you wanted to park some capital. And, you know, one of the things that I look for when I was with a financial planning firm is I think everybody needs to have a number. Like, what is the rate of return that you need during retirement to give you the same amount of income today, or, or at least the income that you need to cover all of your expenses and make sure that you can survive through your retirement, right? And let's say that number is 5%. So let's say you got a, a million dollars and you go, okay, well, 5% is going to do it. You buy uh, some bonds at 5%. Well, you're pretty much guaranteed that all your expenses are going to be paid for over time, barring, uh, you know, crazy surges in inflation. Well, maybe that's part of the reason you're seeing this demand. But look at some of the other countries. United States right now, 4.73, you can see here. Canada, 3.92. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I myself would want to be buying Brazil bonds or Mexico. I just don't know if those governments are that stable. But maybe I go over to Germany. Well, Germany's paying 2.76, not good there. UK is an option, 4.49, but you know the US is, is hands down the highest yield of any major developed country. Now, what if you go to Japan? All right, well, you're getting 0.94. Now, no, no jabs at my friends in the Southern Hemisphere. Australia's at 4.94, New Zealand at 5.37. You know, do you buy those 10-year government bonds and get slightly better yield? The point I'm getting at is the most liquid, largest capital market in the world, the United States, is offering one of the highest rates. And I think you're right, John. That does create some demand because clearly there's demand for these products, um, given the amount of liquidity that's being dumped by the Federal Reserve as well as our Treasury. I think you're right. Mm -hmm. And and uh, who's, who's to say how long it's going to be sustainable mm -hmm. at this level? Uh, you know, that's up for speculation as well. But remember, uh, price rules and uh, price discovery is critical to to the functioning of the capital market. You know, you are you are one that I give credit to. Um, I, I, I praise you when I curse you at the same time um, for getting my brain to think of this not just as I'm trading a stock or I'm trading a futures or I'm trading an option. Um, you know, from the early days at OTA, you know, you were always saying there's a bigger machine here and all of these pieces function together. Obviously, the bond market is not in a silo, neither is the stocks or futures or options. It's all one gigantic machine. So with your vast experience and knowledge, take a step back and hypothesize for me, let's just say the next year. Um, and I know there's no crystal ball, but I know that you look at this information and, and you have an idea of how the domino or how this chess match is going to be played out with the Treasury, the Fed and all that. W what's your hypothesis? Let's start with the bond market, uh, given what's going on. Well, the most honest answer I can give you is I, I certainly don't know. It, it would be only a, a wild ass guess. <laughs> we love uh, wild ass guesses sometimes. <laughs> but, but I mean, you know, I certainly don't have a crystal ball. And anybody that tells you they do, you need to run from them as fast as you can. Agreed. Because they can have an opinion, and and you know what opinions are. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody's got one. And uh, if I had an opinion, I would. Um, I think inflation has proven to be and is still giving us evidence today that inflation in the United States where I live and experience 
and you live on a day-to-day -day basis, that inflation is very sticky. And I, I don't even think the term sticky is appropriate for uh, if you've gone to the supermarket recently, I know Merlin, you probably do your own shopping, don't you? Or does your butler still do your shopping? Oh, please, you? John. I, no, hey, man, I'll tell you what. If, I'm, I should do a whole show on how to shop effectively. I mean, uh, I'd I, love to. I'd love to follow you around shopping. You're you're a very frugal buyer. I have know? a game, John. At the end of every shopping spree, and I have competitions with friends where we'll look at the bottom of our receipt because the store we go to, it'll show you. Uh, what percentage you save on your groceries? And my biggest one was like 51% savings on my groceries. And, and it may seem trivial, but if I'm spending $100 on groceries and I get my bill down to $49, that is a massive savings. And if I do that over and over every time I shop, uh, you know, obviously I can take that money and do a lot more with it. I want you to know, Barbara, there's, I, mean, I want you to know there's only one person I can compare you to in shopping who may do a little bit better than you possibly. And that's my wife, Barbara. She has a black belt in, in grocery store shopping. She even gets down to squeezing the brand, and she reads all the labels. We just had a discussion today. I, I asked her, what happened in our home? How come we don't buy that little round spaghetti we always bought? She was making spaghetti and meatballs yesterday. And I said, what happened to the round spaghetti? She, you're using uh, linguine noodles instead of the round noodles. And I said, they're difficult to cut with a fork. And she says, you're not supposed to cut them. Besides that, linguine needle, noodles are cheaper than round spaghetti. So my, my wife has a black belt in grocery store shopping. John, gauntlet thrown down. I'm looking forward to coming out to visit you. And we are going to – Barbara and I are going to go shopping, and we're going to have a contest. I guarantee it. We're going. We're, I, I, right. I well, love I'll it. It's a, I, I thrive on it. It's a game for me. Well, you know what's happened to price. And you, mm -hmm. you know better than anybody then, as none in Washington, D. D.C. tend to do their own shopping. You know, in Washington D.C., they don't use gasoline, or they, or they don't use, they don't buy electricity, and and they don't use, uh, they they don't shop at the grocery store because they have no clue how sticky uh, price is. You know, yeah, uh, with with a, with a capital S, and with after all this interest rate manipulation by the Fed. They're still talking. Or so, so I don't. I don't see them getting to their target of two percent unless we have a hell of a recession. If we have a hell of a recession, all bets are off. But I'm thinking that we're going to muddle through to uh, 24. Um, I think we're just going to muddle through inflation as we know it today. It's going to be very sticky. There are going to be some components that'll be more sticky than others. There'll be and uh, but I, you know, I don't see the net numbers changing too radically. I think it's going to be. Um, I, I'm very hopeful for with the having on crypto and uh, specifically Bitcoin. Yeah. Um. Uh. For, you know, prices being sticky there, but you know, look how sticky price has been in two, 2013 on Bitcoin. Now up over thirty five thousand again. Yeah. John, you know. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, experts in this industry. I hate the term expert, but there's some people who, who have earned awards for themselves being an expert. Paul Krugman being one of them. Um, Paul Krugman won the Nobel Prize, Nobel Memorial Prize for economic sciences for work he did with uh, new trade theory and new economics geography in 2008. He was on Twitter the other day. Posted a chart of, I think it was CPI numbers, and he says, oh, inflation is over. We've beaten inflation. And the number that he referenced, I think it was actually core CPI, it takes out food and energy. And it's like, how can you ever make a statement that inflation has been defeated when you take out the two most volatile components of inflation, food and energy? So um, if, you had, if you had to say something to Paul Krugman about inflation and in uh, what what do you think you would say to him? I would say you're an idiot. I mean, uh, and that you <laughs> and you and you're you're the most consistent uh, wrong uh, economist I've, I've ever I've ever heard about in in, in my career of watching economics. But the John, he won the Nobel Prize. Prize. Oh, that don't mean squat. What that tell you about the quality of the people that select the Nobel Prize? I mean, come on, give me a break. The only guy that has probably a worse track record would be Jim Cramer. <laughs> and those two 
ought to get together and uh, start a newsletter together. By the way, John, I don't know if you caught this one. Um, the markets love to pick on Jim Cramer. You know, I think he does try to do a good job, but now he's just he's he's earmarked as this uh, puppet for mainstream finance, and he's consistently wrong. He made a comment this week that said there's absolutely no way that Bitcoin will get to a million dollars. And I just sat back and went, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. That's the, that's the double call to get bullish, isn't it? I mean, the, that, that, you know, that, that might even be a hint that you ought to lever up. <laughs> if, yeah, the, the, the confirming would be if Paul Krugman stepped up and, and would say something like that. Oh, it was uh, it was it was fun to see. I, I I just love them when they pick on him, and I think there's actually an ETF now uh, that goes inverse of whatever Jim Cramer picks on his show, which uh, is, I, I believe it's actually outperforming the S and P. But um, sure. all right, well, I don't know. What do, what do you think twenty four is going to look like? You know, and again, my ideas don't really matter. It's just it's just my thought track and. Um, you know, at the beginning of every year, it's actually become one of my favorite things to do on this show. I, there's two things I love on this show. Number one is every day the interaction I get from my audience. So thank you guys who are loyal and have come here every single day. Uh, sometimes I wonder, like, how are you? How can you tolerate listening to me every single day? It would I must be doing something right to have uh, kept you guys here on a regular basis. So thank you guys so much. But some of the things I really enjoy is at the end of the year, I like going through my trading accounts and kind of sharing performance over the year and some accounts do well some accounts do poorly I, you know i have a lot of accounts and i try to run through there and highlight um you know what caused my worst account losses and then also go to you know what was the best account and why just to kind of help people out here and and maybe help them with their um problems or successes as traders the other thing i love is the first show i do in january I go through and I allow everyone to come up with an estimate as to what they think the S&P 500 will be on the last trading day of the year. And of course, it's just an opinion. It's it's a it's a shot in the dark guess. But I like right. to lay it out by quarter. Like I'll say at the beginning of the year, I said Q1 will be up, Q2 will be sideways, Q3 will be down and Q4 will be down and we'll be down on the year. I was wrong. Uh, Q, Q1, I was correct. Q2, I was grossly mistaken. We had a huge up move in Q2. Um, when I thought we'd go sideways, but I've been absolutely spot on on Q3. And if that momentum continues, I may be right on the Q3 down or Q4 down and the end of the year being down. So uh, those are some of my favorite things. To answer your question, where do I think it's going? Uh, I think you're just going to get a lot more volatility at this point. Right now, the expectations are that the Fed is going to start cutting rates next year. If there's anything that continues to provoke that inflation higher, then all of those numbers change. And I think that puts downward pressure on the market. I do believe that this inverted yield curve for so long is going to create problems in the intermediate to longer term for our financial markets. Therefore, I'm bearish for 2024, although they say never go against an election year. Um, we'll see how it all goes. But for right now, I'm feeling like um, volatile markets and, and slightly down. Not Nothing catastrophic. I'm not looking at a, you know, a 2008 kind of crash, but I just think that there's going to be a lack of direction. I think that earnings growth is going to slow. I think that consumption is going to stall. And all this money that they spent to stimulate the economy, once that gets pulled out, we'll have some economic problems. So that's, that's what I think. I don't know that's if I'm right. No, that's interesting. Yeah. And, and, you know, in hindsight, all we can do is look back and say, oh, yeah, I was right on this. I was wrong on that. And that's fine. Um, you know, I've always emphasized for all the viewers well, here, don't uh, don't hang your hat on anything that I say. You know, have a plan in place. And, uh, you know, the fact that I say I think 2024 is going to be a down year doesn't doesn't mean you need to be buying leaps right now and saying I'm shorting this market or, or selling leaps. Um, no, there you go. Yeah. And uh, when it all averages out and a lot of it does average out. One sector you're bullish on does poorly. The other sector does well, kind of averages out. Speaking of bonds, one more time, I, I'm uh, uh, over my screen. I'm, I just saw a report on Bloomberg where a, a small community in Missouri uh, defaulted on their municipal bonds because they had uh, backed uh, or the funds were used uh, to build a, a, a shopping center. And the shopping center oh, yeah. went, went into foreclosure. 
And, uh, and there's a case where almost overnight the bid on those bonds evaporates. So when we talk about bond vigilantes, we need to think about that there are different kinds of bonds that can have different risk and reward characteristics. Absolutely. And, and, and liquidity. I mean, what kind of liquidity was there in, in that particular bond in a little, little farming community in the state of Missouri, you know, probably didn't trade, but once a year by appointment. So, you know, who's to say what they're really worth. Yeah. You, you just, yeah, you never know. Um, and, and again, when you have, City government, this kind of freaks me out when you have city governments or infrastructure plays where they put a lot of money into one area of the economy or market and it gets crushed, you know, I, I look at how much that impacts that group. So let's say you have a pension fund for, I don't know, the school district in your, your area of, of um, Missouri and they put in bad investments and all of a sudden they have to go belly up and, and all those people that are paying into that hoping to get a nice yield all of a sudden end up with nothing. That's the danger of the financial markets, especially uh, for the big speculators out there. Well, that's why you need to, if you're going to go into the bond market, you kind of need to think about having, if you're going to be a long-term holder of bonds, you might want to think about holding a portfolio and spreading that risk over several issues. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, um, it's difficult, isn't it? it very Look difficult. At, I don't know. I don't know if you followed the uh, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft strategies bonds. But they have been, uh, I haven't followed them real closely, but I know that they have, uh, uh, they've been very volatile with the swings in price in Bitcoin. I have not followed their bonds, but I mean, of course they're going to follow, I'm uh, sorry, of course they're going to be very volatile. I mean, you have, um, you know, Michael Saylor with billions of dollars that he's issued debt against and bought Bitcoin with it. Smart man in hindsight, like today, he's loving it. I mean, you guys have seen what's been going on with Bitcoin in the last uh uh, well, last weeks have been great, but uh, you've seen a pretty nice surge up here. It actually just surged up and then came ripping back down. So uh, people getting all excited about Bitcoin. Got to love the volatility of that asset class. But I'll bring up Bitcoin here to show you right now. Here's BTC. We, uh, we've we broken out. And as you guys might remember, I was talking about a bullish flag formation on Bitcoin where it surged up and then went sideways for a little bit. Uh, we've officially broken out of that, which means my next target's Right around forty-three thousand dollars on Bitcoin. So, congrats to uh, us. That hopefully, it keeps on running and running and running. Um, well, what was that? Go ahead. It's going to be speaking of Bitcoin. It's going to be interesting. And speaking of bonds, on what happens mm -hmm. to the Bitcoin miners' bonds uh, coming up in twenty-four? Uh, they've been aggressive in issue, issuing stock, uh, but some of them are credit worthy and, and been able to issue bonds. And I assure you that uh, BlackRock is, I'm sure, engaged not only in, in buying their equities, but also buying their debt instruments mm -hmm. that are convertible. And, it's, and many of them are secured uh, by, their, uh, by their Bitcoin inventory in, in Treasury. So there's going to be a lot of interesting plays with the halving coming up, because I think there's going to be a minor shakeout. And only the credit worthy of the miners uh, are going to be able to get through this having. Yeah, I agree. You know, um, you uh, you mentioned um, mentioned the miners and BlackRock in the same breath, and I got to ask. You know, I, I I'm struggling to find the answer to this question. I think I have it, but um, let me run my hypothesis past you. Obviously, BlackRock is the forefront uh, expected to win the spot Bitcoin ETF. We've seen the market surge over the past couple of weeks because of the actions of Gary Gensler and the, uh, the SEC with regards to just working with these firms. Now, I think there's nine companies looking for a spot Bitcoin ETF. And I wrote an article for Bar Chart back in April. And in that article, I talk about why I think Bitcoin will be at $45,000 by August. And that was basically, if this is approved, if we get a spot Bitcoin ETF, what you're going to get, and let's just assume it's BlackRock and probably three others, BlackRock now will have to procure a lot of Bitcoin. And because demand for the ETF will most likely be significantly high, because now people can buy into Bitcoin without actually having to hold it, they can buy an ETF, which is safe and insured, there's going to be huge demand. Expectations are billions of dollars worth of demand within the first couple months. If that's the case, BlackRock needs to buy Bitcoin to back that up. And there's only three places I think that they're going to get it. Number one, they created out of thin air, which is impossible, as you know. 
Number two, they go to the retail market and they just start buying up retail Bitcoin. If they did that, Bitcoin's going to be $100,000 by the time they finally get their position built. Option number three is they go to the government who has over 200,000 Bitcoin right now and maybe they can work some deal. But if I'm the government, I know that you're going to get approved for this Bitcoin ETF. I know you're going to drive my Bitcoin up in price. I'm going to hold it. Option four is they go to the miners who you mentioned, you know, they're buying their debt of the, of the, um, of the miners and they'll go to a marathon. They'll go to a riot and say, hey, listen. You know, we own some of your company. We're, you know, got maybe got a seat on your board of directors. I don't know what the case may be. How about you custody all of your Bitcoin with us? We will hold it and it will be in the ETF and we will pay you. It'd be like a loan. We'll pay you interest on that Bitcoin. And that's the only way I can see them buying that much Bitcoin without moving the market. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, what's, what's the incentive for the miner to do that, first of all? I would the say miners, safety. I would say safety, and the and the miners would get a yield. So they probably the fees may get paid directly to the miners. Maybe, the maybe they get a maybe they get a. Let's say BlackRock comes to Marathon, and at Marathon's got what eight thousand eighty six hundred Bitcoin, I believe, in Treasury. They they give them an IOU. They borrow eight thousand of their Bitcoin. Give them an IOU, which yields some interest. That might be about the only decision, but you know that's only three hundred million. That's only three hundred million dollars worth. And I, I know it's three hundred million, and that may take care of the first hour of trading. <laughs> but however, however, uh, uh, remember that they they have an a marathon has an incentive too to see that Bitcoin jump up. Of course, so they may. They still have, I guess, the IOU that they can get back the Bitcoin and enjoy some of the appreciation. Uh, but they already have that Bitcoin probably in cold storage. Mm -hmm. so, so it's kind of a balance sheet play. And they have all this would have to be disclosed. Sure, of course. Okay, it'd have to be disclosed by probably both parties. Yeah, I, I'm curious. I, I don't know what's going uh, Big Ed makes a really good point. He says, but Merlin, you're assuming the government manages the money correctly with reference to their Bitcoin. <laughs> good point there, Big Ed. I, I am making that well, assumption. He also <laughs> assuming that the government has somebody in charge of making a rational decision that even really knows what a Bitcoin is and what, the, and what, the, and what, what their incentive should be on why they should have an incentive for a high... Remember, they've been they've been net sellers of Bitcoin ever since they confiscated it right. from from some entities. So they weren't smart enough to sell it at the right price. So yeah, that's a big assumption. Uh, well, you're right; they're going to have to get it from somewhere. Um, the miners, uh, I know that for sure that BlackRock, in the early stages of when Marathon was trying to get a funding, they bought some of their shares, or or someone bought their shares remember blackrock may not own the shares on uh, they may own them on behalf of clients uh, they own some mutual funds that in their iShares uh, brand that might have may be the net holders of those uh, shares of Black riot and marathon so I'm not convinced that marathon BlackRock as an, marathon as an institution has disclosed ownership of Black or of Marathon, uh, of seven point seven point four percent of the company. Well, are they as a company or as buying it on behalf of their funds? Uh, I believe it's just as the institution it says disclosed ownership, the seven point four percent. So, well, their fund, their fund may have it. Yeah, you know, their fund could have it, or, or it could be you know owned in some percentage wise. But remember. BlackRock's not, I don't think they have a venture capital arm. Um, in the early stages of the Bitcoin miners, um, you know, they may have some venture capital funds that they act as custodian for the shares. But I don't know. We'd have to, we'd have to. We'd in have an to article that I just read, um, you know, it says that Marathon, or sorry, BlackRock has major holdings in four of the five largest Bitcoin mining companies, including Riot, Marathon, Cypher, and Hut8, as well as Terra Wolf. So, uh, you know, it, it almost feels like they knew this was coming and like, okay, we're going to go for that spot, Bitcoin ETF. 
it, and maybe they just had tremendous foresight. If they did, hats off to them because this is would be a, a brilliant move. Would be to align themselves with those miners, get yourselves on the board of directors so you can now call the shots there and influence where they keep that Bitcoin. And, and I agree, uh, there could be some um, uh, interest payment. So you guys plan on holding that Bitcoin anyway, we will hold that Bitcoin for you. And see, typically what miners do is they'll sell their Bitcoin to help fund operations. BlackRock may step in and say, we'll take all 8,600 Bitcoin from you know um, Marathon and however many from Riot, et cetera, to get our position. And then they'll look back and say, if you have shortfalls of capital and you need money, we'll give you loans. We'll give you cash on that and we'll do it low. So they yeah. may negotiate something good here. I personally think that's where it's all going to come from is from these miners. I, I don't the see the government doing it. I know the last, the last three months, um, Marathon and Riot have sold like 90% of their Bitcoin production mm -hmm. and held like on average 10 to 15% uh, in treasury. So... Um, because they got to covering their operating costs, right? Uh, Which is a lot. Also, also uh, Marathon recently uh, delevered uh, their debt on their balance sheet by over fifty three percent. So in the getting and ready for the having, because they want to be liquid in the having. So they've been net sellers of their Bitcoin, knowing even knowing the having's coming up, but uh, they're selling ninety percent of what their production is. Mm -hmm. They, and they've been producing Marathon. I don't know about Riot, but Marathon, Marathon's been producing like double the Bitcoin each month. I know they produce about 40 uh, because they have more hash power, but they are producing about 40 Bitcoins a day. Man. So if you sell it, they're selling either to the market or they could enter into a private treaty transaction right. and sell to BlackRock. Well, I'll tell you what, John, looking at these miners, it doesn't look pretty, guys. Here's HUT 8. Um, HUT 8 was at $4.50 back in July, currently at $2.20. Here's Riot. Same chart. It was over $20 back in July, now sitting at 10 so it's on 50%. And you got Mara, same picture here. All of them looking pretty ugly. Uh, Mar Marathon was up at about 20 bucks in July, currently sitting at $8.92. So a uh, pretty ugly slide for these miners, even though, you know, it's interesting – when you look uh, at those miners charts like I just showed you, let's take a peek at the Bitcoin chart, just kind of overlap them there, totally different. You would think that the mining stocks would be screaming to the upside based off the current market moves. And, and that may have a lot to do with what John's talking about. They just don't have a large inventory of Bitcoin anymore, and it's not that impactful. Um, when you look at somebody who does have a large position like uh, MSTR, right? Now, all of a sudden, you're seeing a much bigger move to the upside. MicroStrategy has gone from 320 bucks to 449 in just a couple of weeks, actually just a week uh, based off this last move for Bitcoin. Pretty impressive. Yeah. Well, and they, and they don't, and, and remember that at least half of their Bitcoin are secured by debt. <laughs> and uh, yep. that, that's going to have to get cleaned up. Well, it will I be. Think... I mean, look, if you, if you issue bonds at 6.5%, and your Bitcoin's earning you 20% per year, that's a win-win. That's good debt. You know, keep, do more of it. <laughs> well, as long as you have the operating income to service the debt. Correct. The, the, those bonds have a debt service requirement on them. But remember, you know, MicroStrategy is, is an operating company, has $500 million a year gross revenue that runs about an 80% margin on that revenue because they're a software company producing business analytics so they're they're covering their debt service they're not selling their bitcoin no they're a debt buyer through eternity and uh you know as long as that business doesn't get eaten up by you know google or somebody right they're in good shape absolutely um, Big Eb says, uh, Mike Shady took $134 million loss today on their earnings, writing down Bitcoin, but the stock is is up after hours. So, all right. Yeah, they're up 1.95% uh, right now in the after hour session. Um, John, what else do you want to discuss? Anything, any last minute stuff here? I had to wrap up so I can go over the broad markets and then uh, move on you to some of the things. About, you, I've, uh, you want to talk about gold? You want to talk about precious Let's do metals? It. You wanna... Let's do it. What's your thoughts on gold, Mr. Goldbug? Well, I spent, I've had a conversion since I moved to North Carolina in that uh, pre, at, certainly ever since you and I have known one another, I have been Mr. Goldbug. Uh, but, you know, I became Goldbug long before I met you. I, I, I think, I don't know. I think you were Goldbug before I was born. 
probably was. Yeah. Uh, but um, but I've um, I, I I think Bitcoin for for my passion for gold, I virtually have sold all my gold positions north of two thousand. Uh, I did I did some of that in in the fall of twenty twenty, but since the fall of twenty twenty. I haven't I haven't had any long exposure to gold at all. Oh, I've and got a little I, bit. I've got a little bit. I have a few gold coins, um, you know, I, generally scarce ones. So I've got a bunch of 18, well, uh, several uh, from the 1800s that are, you know, graded and are plastic and in a safe place and a couple just uh, loose gold coins, tenth of an ounce and one ounce gold coin. So yeah, I've got the, some uh, in there, but that's long term hold. I don't even I don't even consider selling that stuff at any at any point. Right. Well, what, what's replaced replaced my gold passion is that Bitcoin is now digital gold for me, but Bitcoin is also my uh, unit of account. I, I do all my financial computation in Sats now, and uh, that's a big change for that, you. Huh? Pardon me. I said that's a big change for you. I mean, I remember you used to go to this website called PricedInGold.com, and you know, that was you love that site. Now there's probably PricedInBitcoin.com for you, right? There is. Go to Bitcoin. <laughs> No, it's even more extensive in PriceInBitcoin.com because the price is everything in Sats. Does the math for you, and it's got literally everything in it, and uh, I love it. And it's now caused me to uh, be—it's my unit of account. I don't care what the financial universe might teach for me, and for it's been a generational change for me to get off gold, and and now I'm uh, on the Bitcoin horse. Nice. Uh, well, so we didn't. So you still have but to have, have a hypothesis have on gold. For that. I mean, I mean, you you were the one that turned me on to Bitcoin. So I have. I'm telling you, that's a personal thank you to you, and uh, oh, because well. you're the one that got me started on that. Well, my Thinking pleasure. About it. Yeah. I, you know, I, I hope that it does what I what I believe it's going to do. If it doesn't, then, you know, then there's a problem there. But hopefully we'll uh, get – I know we don't like the word hope. It's a dangerous one. But, um, you know, I'm optimistic that we will see continued price improvement for Bitcoin going forward. But let's – just looking at the gold chart here, though. Um, I know you might not have it right in front of you. You know, you mentioned selling out in 2000 – or 2020 near those – near 2000 uh, price level. You know, we're right back up there right now. It's at 1987. It feels like it's traversed sideways for quite some time. Are, are you bullish on gold? I mean, when we have international conflict like Iran and the whole Israel thing and Ukraine, um, plus uncertainty about the markets going forward, typically, you know, gold and silver do very well. And, and we haven't seen that big surge up. Do, are you still optimistic that we will see one or is it is that that connect in, connection dead? Well, well, gold is really the ultimate crisis hedge. I mean, it has a... Uh, um, some of the spotlight has been taken off gold as a confidence hedge. Uh, but, you know, if we start to see some of these currencies and some of these countries continue to collapse, I mean, if you look at what's happening in Turkey and it would, what's what's happening in Venezuela and, and you know, some of these countries, um, the currency is just getting in trouble. I think there's like 175 countries that have out there that have independent currencies that um, are probably, you know, half of them are going to disintegrate in, in your lifetime. Yeah. And not my lifetime, but your lifetime. And uh, this ultimately is, is this flight to safety characteristic of gold. Uh, some of that's going to flash into Bitcoin's camp as that hedge against crisis. Um, but that's going to take some time. Yeah. But, you know, look how long it's taken for gold. I mean, when I got in the gold market, Merlin, uh, gold was $35 an ounce in 1971. Look how long it's taken to go from $35 an ounce nominal price to roughly 2000 today. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the per annum return on gold, it's really a shiny rock that collects dust. Yeah. <laughs> you know, especially in the last few years. Um, you know, uh, if you held it in tw 2000 to 2010, uh, you'd be singing a different tune, right? That was a very nice move up. But we haven't seen that that gigantic uh, increase in value because it's, quote unquote, a scarce item. Or a lot of people think, oh, there's scarcity to it. Yeah, and that's oh. true. 
um, it was up 626% in a uh, little over 10 years. Uh, whereas you look at something like Bitcoin, you know, obviously we could look at the charts of it, but this, this, the, the numbers are, are far more significant. And, and I think that the difference here is it's a new asset class, right? We look at Bitcoin, it's something that's brand new and it doesn't have a, a lot of adoption yet. And that's really where I'm hanging my hat on. I know we've talked about this a lot is if we start to get adoption, for Bitcoin and it becomes used by central banks, can hold it and other assets, um, other countries start buying into a little bit more, then you get adoption. And that's when you start to see these just gigantic moves up. I mean, from the low to the peak, you're looking at an 862,000% rate of return uh, going back to 2011. So that same decade, uh, 10 years, you had Bitcoin with an 862,000% gain. I, I don't know if we'll get those types of rates of return, but I think once you get wow. acceptance and, and more central banks look at it, we get the framework from our governments which say, all right, here's here's what Bitcoin is, here's how it's listed, here's the protections you can get like SIPC protection, et cetera. Um, you know, that'll foster an adoption. And if Lightning Network can all make the payment systems faster and more robust, then people like myself will have a choice in the system. And and I think that'll push adoption of Bitcoin and, and therefore my, my lofty price target. Well, I think, it, you know, adoption, you, you're talking about getting liquid on Bitcoin at a peak of, of from last time I talked to you at about a quarter of a million dollars a coin Correct. in the fourth quarter of 2025. Correct. Uh, by fourth quarter of 2025, I doubt that adoption will have uh, be at a much higher number. Correct. Uh, adoption is going to take decades, in, in my opinion. Yeah. I look how long it took to adopt to the internet. I mean, it's been slow. I, mean, it, I think it caught like wildfire at a certain point. This will take longer. Um, but yes, I, I, am, I do believe uh, adoption will take longer. I don't believe that the rally that I'm talking about going from, from today until 2025 is going to be caused by adoption. It's slight adoption. I think what fuels that rally is, number one, the halving that happens in April, and number two, understanding from governments and central banks around the world what exactly we can do with Bitcoin, right? Is it a commodity? Is it a security? Let's get that all cleared up. Okay, now we can start using products and building products and services around it. Can I hold it on my balance sheet as a company? Oh, I can? Okay, now all of a sudden you'll see companies uh, in a much um, safer way hold Bitcoin. And, and remember, this is a retail held environment. Most of the people that hold Bitcoin are retailers like myself and you and Big Eb, John. It's not, this isn't Goldman Sachs sitting on $500 million worth of Bitcoin. They're going to start to build positions and that drives that price for the next move up. And I think that's, I think it's, it's corporate adoption, which will drive it up to that peak in 2025. And I don't know what's going to cause the big sell off as it usually happens of about 70 to 80%, but uh, um, I'll, I'll be in cash at that point and not worried. The uh, certainly the uh, ETF condition to come about yeah. in, in early, hopefully early 25 or the end of even uh, 24. But uh, do you think the SEC is ever going to get off some of these um, crypto coins in, 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 in whether they're securities or not? <laughs> you mean, do I think that Gary Gensler can pull his, his team's collective head out of their ass and figure it out? Um, Yes, I do. I think there's going to be some legal pressure from our uh, from our senators out there to say, listen, you've had way too much time and too much money to say this is security or not. What will happen is we'll get better clarity. I think we're going to get an upgrade to the Howey test, which I think is an outdated uh, test of what a security is because it was written in the 50s and didn't really account for anything digital. So we have to upgrade the rules. Once that's done, I think that the vast majorities of cryptocurrencies will disappear. Because it'll be very clear, you are a security. Therefore, you you have to go through all these steps to be a security with the SEC. If not, get out. And I think that's going to push a lot of this junk away, which I'm very happy about. Get rid of Shiba Inu. Get rid of Dogecoin. Get rid of Pepe. Get rid of Floki. Get rid of so many of these other scam coins. And then legitimate projects, which are trying to do good things, uh, will either conform to the security rules and continue, or they'll just disappear. So I, I'm all for it. I think you what you'll get is... All this money that's in crypto and focusing on 1.8 million different projects will now be focusing on, let's say, uh, you know, 2,000 projects. And I think when you have that kind of capital focusing on a smaller group, prices will surge. What about ETH? You, where do you think they're going to end up? A commodity or a security? 
Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, I, I think it's going to go more towards a commodity. Remember, it doesn't have a centralized team. There, are, It's a decentralized network. Now, they're taking steps to make it more decentralized, which will give it a better uh, pass of the Howey test. But, you know, there's, that's the big question um, that the Howey test rules. I, I think it'll probably fall into the category of a commodity just because of its decentralization. Uh, but, you know, look, all of these things fail the Howey test in one simple thing. We buy them with the expectation of them going up in value. Now, the Howey test states that that has to be because of a team's effort to make it go up in value. There isn't a central team, right? There's no central team for Ethereum. There are teams. There's the Ethereum Foundation and many other groups working on it, but not one in general. So for that reason, I think it'll pass the, the Howey test and, and be labeled as a commodity. Um, you know, right now, what we'll see is the Bitcoin ETF, I think will get approved most likely this month, if not by the end of the year. Um, after that happens, I think that'll bring a bigger attention from our regulators to crypto in general and then they'll be asking for more clarity on some of these other assets i mean you know you've got hundreds of assets on coinbase and kraken and gemini are those securities or are they not let's just tell us what it is <laughs> we're not doing an hour show john i gotta wrap it up here <laughs> not, not you john o'donnell but john uh Brundret, Brundret here says we're doing a one hour show mm -mm, no one hour shows today um but i think ethereum will be i know you're not going to like this one john I think that Ethereum will flip Bitcoin with regards to market capitalization. There you go. Well, uh, I don't hope you're right on that one. But <laughs> I'm positioned we'll in both, so I'm, I'm fine with them both. That's what makes a market, right? That's right. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think that, you know, Bitcoin's, Bitcoin's cash. Bitcoin's digital gold. Bitcoin's money. Ethereum is the largest decentralized computer in the world. And that's just, it's hard for people to understand that it's a decentralized computer. You can do so much more on a, a global decentralized computer. There's just all the programming companies and applications that can be built. To me, there's just trillions of dollars worth of value in there. And if Ethereum can build scalability, they can get, you know, let's say to 1,500 transactions or 100,000 transactions per second, then they'll dominate it. Well, we'll see. We shall. Uh, John, anything you're doing? Are you doing any teaching, presenting? You know, anything I can drive, promote for you? No. No. Nah. You know, just uh, light a candle for Israel. Yeah. Yeah. I'm lighting candles. I'm lighting a whole uh, panel of them for just peace on so many levels around the world. It's just kind of kind of crazy what's going on right now. But uh, Amen. Yeah. Uh, it's it's well, unfortunate, but. My father's generation went through World War One and World War II. And so uh, these skirmishes aren't near as anything close to what 40 million people died in World War II. Yeah, yeah. Well, let, let's hope that this doesn't get any worse. Um, for a peaceful resolution, I will cheers you to that one. John, thank you so much for coming on today. I appreciate it. Um, I'll try to bring on more frequently. I love the Bond Vigilante talk and I always appreciate your, your thoughts and commentary. So thank you, my friend. Great to have you back on. All right, great. All right, take care. Good. Good luck. Thanks. Guys, yeah, that was John O'Donnell. I call him the ambassador of opportunity. Um, Longtime friend of mine, and I uh, used to work with him at OTAA. He actually signed me up for my first trading class many, 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 many years ago. 1998 was my first trading class at John O'Donnell. All right, how much time do I have left? I have seven minutes. Okay, let's go. Yes, All Saints Day today, which is the day that you're supposed to, uh, Dios de los Muertos as well, where you're supposed to remember uh, those that have passed on. And I'm sure all of us have family, or friends, acquaintances uh, who have passed on. Um, reflect on those individuals today. And remember, we're grateful to have our time on this spinning rock, just hurling through space. Um, yeah. Every day, grateful for that one. All right, let me real quickly run through what happened out there in our markets. I know you guys have seen this. Obviously, Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve saying, we're not going to raise rates today, which means I have a little bit of a surprise for you. That's right. Uh, John O'Donnell was our guest today, but tomorrow, Bill Addis is coming back on. I want to talk about, we're going to break down all the little details of not only the announcement, but the press conference. Uh, I took a lot of notes today watching that press conference. Really interesting to see just words that change. So the way that he says things leads me to believe that there are certain things going to happen next year or at least in upcoming meetings. So we're going to talk about that with Bill Addis on tomorrow's show. So we've got a back-to-back -back guest on the Trader Merlin show. Here's what it looked like for today. Here's our crude oil chart. We'll go back to a daily time frame here. Uh, bomb. Still continuing down. Again, um, 
mentioned this one yesterday, was really disappointed to see it break this 8150 mark and close below it and continuing to drift lower today. Uh, yes, it was tough. Um, you look at gold down 0.34% today. Still not freaking out about gold, even though it's been three down days in a row. Um, we do have some lower lows that let's say it gets below 1965. Then I'll start to be a little bit concerned with the, um, the bigger retracement here, which could bring us down to 1930, then 1880, and all of a sudden closing that gap at 1840. So there are some interesting levels ahead for gold. That was your seventh place finisher. Dollar index actually has a shooting star today. Someone texted me that, and I'm like, no, it's actually not a shooting star because it's not really after a big uptrend, but I'll let it slide. The formation itself looks like a uh, shooting star formation. So that's actually a bearish thing for the dollar index. That typically, when you have that, typically means that you're going to see it reverse and come back down. A down move would mean bullishness for our markets. Uh, let's see, what else we have? The 10 years. So you saw this big red candle today. I'll give you a percentage down move. On the day, you're looking at a 4% slide in the yield for the 10 year. While it looks dramatic until we get below this 4.55 or 4.54 mark, uh, I'm not worried about the uptrend. I still think the uptrend is intact and we'll continue on. But yeah, big, big drop today. You now looking at what the, the Treasury is doing and selling all those bonds, which we'll talk about tomorrow with Bilatus, as well as the Fed unwinding their balance sheet. There's just too much selling going on to, uh, to watch these yields decline much. All right, fourth place, that's Bitcoin. All right, we did break to the upside here. Of course, the futures markets for Bitcoin right now is paused. The uh, spot price for Bitcoin, as you guys can see here, has been moving even higher. I will bring that up for you just so we can see as we wrap up this show. How much time do I have left? Four minutes, perfect. We are right now at 45,300 on Bitcoin and the Bitcoin futures, $400 behind that. So it's uh, a much better looking chart when I look at spot. All in all, a pretty decent day for Bitcoin, uh, especially as of right now. And what did I do here? Let's go to our third place finisher. That's the Russell up 0.48%. So I mentioned now, you know, the one I'd be interested in buying, I said this on um, Monday's show, interested in buying it, Russell, even though I've been short on it for a while, uh, I did not buy it. I made a, um, my other play was on the NASDAQ 100, but the Russell 2000 up 0.48% today. The S&P having a nice rally up 1.04%, although keep an eye on it. You're coming up to a short-term supply zone on the S&P, and then you have the NASDAQ 100, which ripped today. Man, I'm so bummed that I closed out my call position. Today would have been a monster day based off my position and the gain. 1.75% up for the NASDAQ today. Yowzers. Now, here's where it changes. NASDAQ again up 1.75%. Drum roll, please. I, I literally, the last five seconds of the market, I threw an order out there to buy directional, not, not collecting premium, but buying directional short or selling directional. I uh, shorted the NASDAQ 100. Now I did that uh, for a couple of weeks going out to November 17th. The plan is Friday, I'm out. I do, I'm hanging my hat on a bet that Apple is gonna miss earnings. They're gonna lower their forecast and things are gonna slide for Apple. I think the economic pressure is gonna be a little bit too much. Chinese issues are gonna be a little bit too much. Supply chain disruption is a little bit too much. And ultimately, I believe demand for that iPhone 15 is gonna be much lower than expected. Therefore, I'm expecting Apple to have a pretty significant down move and pull this whole thing down. That is a huge speculation trade on my part. Now, it's not massive. I'm not going way overboard on this one, but just wanted to share that one. Uh, with you because that is my my thought on this market going forward. Anyway, that is your top seven markets. We've talked um, pretty much everything out there today. I want to thank John O'Donnell, our guest, for coming on. Tomorrow, as I mentioned, we're going to have Bill Addis on the program. Bill says, Apple could upend the gains from today or add to it. Totally. It could absolutely add to it. And that's the big speculation I have there. Uh, why not just trade Apple? Because I can't, Margaret. I'm not allowed to trade Apple. Yep. I'm not allowed to trade. It's in my trading plan. Page three, red apple, circle, can't trade apple. It's been there since 2000, I want to say 2000, maybe even 1999. Uh, that's been in my trading plan. So it's just a rule I've had. It's kind of the cornerstone of my discipline. So I can't trade apple. I know, it's weird. Uh, let's see. If NASDAQ drops a lot, I'll sell NQ puts again. There you go. I'll be watching because I want to buy apple. <laughs> Good. I mean, we'll all be watching, right? We'll talk about that tomorrow. It's going to be a pretty crazy one. But yeah, I can't trade Apple. Therefore, I'm going with the triple Qs. Uh, and given the fact that it's 11% of the index, I think it'll have a pretty significant move. All right. It's a one-hour show. I officially breached it. Dang it. 
There you go. One hour. Thank you guys so much. Enjoy. I will see you tomorrow with Bill Addis. If you have questions, send them in. TraderMerlin at gmail.com. Take care, everyone. I'll see you tomorrow.